welcome to NoClip, the podcast about people who play and make video games. Our guest this week is an independent developer responsible for 2013's political passport checker, Papers, Please, and the recently released seafaring ditherpunk solve em up Return of the Oberdin. Today he lives on the island nation of Japan, which makes me even more grateful for his time today, as it's currently 9 a.m. here in Maryland, uh, which makes it around 11 p.m. in Tokyo. But uh, if the conversation flows, we should hopefully get him in bed before midnight. I'm delighted to be joined by Lucas Pope. Lucas, thank you so much for making the time today. Yeah, thanks, Danny. I'm uh, happy to be here. Do you feel like you have sort of a, a less uh, busy schedule these days? I mean, you, you finished up on Oberdin, and I'm, I'm guessing you then spent a, a lot of time sort of fixing bugs and whatnot. Are you, uh, has it eased off a bit now? Uh, yeah, definitely. It, it was exactly that, basically, where I, I released the game uh, and spent a long time fixing stuff that was broken, more or less. Uh, and then that's kind of cooled off a lot now. But the, I mean, the work stuff has cooled off, but I was sort of holding off so many other things in my life uh, with family stuff and everything else that once even that work stuff was done, there was a huge stack of things I needed to take care of after that. So that most of that also is sort of out of the way. So now I'm finally able to kind of cool down a little bit and take it easy. Now you're able to do your podcast backlog for the the, the previous four and a half years. More or less, yes, actually, exactly that. <laughs> um, how's the game backlog looking? Uh, did you get much time to play stuff over the development of it? Or it sounds like it's a lot of work making these games, uh, especially on your own. So do you, do you sort of like disconnect from mainstream game releases for a while? A little bit, yeah. On the things that I would normally play, yes. I was still playing things like uh, Mario games with my kids and, and Switch games and stuff like that. But... On the stuff that I should be checking on, most of that, yeah, was just stuck in a pile somewhere, and I'm kind of going through that now very slowly. Awesome. Um, let's go back in time just a little bit before we sort of uh, dive into the design of uh, of the two games that most people will know you from. Um, I feel like if there was a Venn diagram of people we talked to on NoClip, the biggest, uh, you know, one sort of section would be folks who worked on Quake mods, and uh, you apparently fall into that department as well. Yeah, represent. Um, what Was that your first sort of foray into design? What did you work on? Uh, I wouldn't say that. It was my first foray into 3D design. Uh, where and also where you could put a tiny bit of effort in and then see it in 3D was just mind blowing. So I had done like small sort of uh, C64 games or hypercard games or basic type in kind of things before that. But Quake was the one where you could just open up a texture in an editor and draw a few things and then you could play it in the game in 3D. It was like the kind of stuff that you would dream about with SGI workstation kind of things, or when you see, you know, N64 and just blown away by the fact that it's 3D, Quake was where you could edit that stuff in 3D, which was just kind of a re revelation for me. And a big change from what I was doing before, which was just kind of 2D, simpler, expected things that you would, you know, in, in 96 or whatever, by that time, most of the other kinds of games were pretty mature 2D stuff. So Quake was... Yeah, kind of mind blowing. And the, again, it wasn't just the texture stuff. It was also it was everything. You could make models, you could do animation, you could write code that had this really nice Quake C system. So it was just really the perfect thing for me at that moment in time, just to be able to do that kind of stuff easily and then get it right into the game and actually play it. What was the aspect of it that uh, appealed to you back then? Because, uh, you know, you, you seem to be the type of person who enjoys m many facets of this type of work. Was there an aspect of it that spoke to you uh, in particular back then? Was it uh, programming or was it, did you, did you just like, I don't know, making something that actually sort of existed uh, as quickly as possible in that process? Yeah, probably that last one. I, I started doing textures, which was the easiest thing. You could just take one of the textures and there were tools right away that would convert hmm. Uh, to the you know some PNG or BMP that you could edit, and then it would convert it back to the Quake format. So that's what I started doing. Uh, I guess at that time I fancied myself an artist, although I really wasn't very good. Um, you could be not that great, and it still look okay because it was transforming so much to put it in 3D. So I started with textures, uh, and I was at the time actually studying computer science. So. Uh, it was kind of a natural slide right into the Quake C stuff and programming some of the logic when maybe our programmer had too much stuff to do or something on, on a couple of the mods we were working on. And, and I decided to just like slip in and write some system or, or you know, fuck around with the code a little bit. Right. And once I was 
kind of in that position of being comfortable doing art and then uh, programming, I, I mean, I kind of realized this before that time, but it was, I was very comfortable basically doing lots of different stuff and sort of uh, not killing myself on any one thing, kind of trying to decide where I should spend my energy and what, what would be important in this case? Would it be better looking or better uh, behavior or, you know, better sounding? I kind of like that engineering challenge of, of uh, allocating resources. And it worked out for me because I, not that I could do all those things very well, but I was at least interested in doing all those different disciplines when making a game. Right. And I can sort of appreciate how you ended up then working as an independent developer. Um, what I'm kind of interested in then is what was it like working at Naughty Dog where, you know, I imagined you were probably pigeonholed into a specific uh, type of work, right? Sort of. Uh, Naughty Dog was really nice because when I started there, I was the GUI tools guy, which means making a graphical tool for the designers to use or the artists to use or things like that. And that was not a popular position. So <laughs> right. I maybe I was pigeonholed, but my hole was huge. And on the other side of that was a huge space for me to play around in because nobody else was directing me at all, basically. I could decide, okay, the designers need this kind of tool and I'm going to make it. And then they're happy with it. Great. They need these features. I'll do those too, that sort of thing. Um, so for me, Naughty Dog was really liberating because I had all that space and no one else was really telling me what to do. But at the same time, I was working alongside just brilliant programmers and amazing artists. And it's it kind of a dream position, basically, because I, I needed to integrate really well, but kind of on my own terms. And it just it worked out perfectly for me because I could make these tools and then the designers and the artists could use them and I could see the final result. And when you when you have that caliber of artist or that caliber of designer, they can use anything and it'll look good. So, you know, maybe it wasn't even my tools that were any good, but at least I got the satisfaction of seeing the awesome stuff they were making with my tools. So it was perfect. When we talk to independent developers, you, you sort of these days you're getting a lot more, I feel like graduates who are jumping straight into it, but um, of a certain generation, like for instance, I was just over with System Era in uh, Seattle, uh, who are, they're working on Astroneer, which is coming out this week. Uh, and a lot of that crew are X343 people. Um, do you think that, you know, having that sort of AAA experience is, is kind of like, was very important to your uh, professional development or was it the type of thing that just, you know, even if you were learning independently, you feel like you would have got to where you are now? Uh, that's a good question. I think I wouldn't generalize and say AAA, but I would say specifically Naughty Dog taught me a lot about production and about kind of seeing what's important in your game as you're making it and using that to triage and to cut things and to, to really focus on what you have decided is important about your game. That was all critical. I think there's a there's a slight danger in working in AAA that the quality of things that the artists and designers and the sound guys and everybody and the programmers create is super, super high. And just the sort of production style in general is that you have very skilled people and you can give them difficult tasks and they will do a great job. And that, in my opinion, does not scale down to smaller studios. You kind of have to right. cut more corners. You have to rely more on your tools and your pipeline and you have to make more concessions to just produce the same amount of stuff. And that's kind of, I mean, a snapshot of what I do is I try not to compete in that way. I consciously say like, I, there's no way I can match the art skill of, of a Naughty Dog or a AAA studio. So I'm going to try to kind of leap, not leapfrog, but I'm just going to go a completely different way and not compete on those same terms at all. So that's part of the challenge of making a game for me is finding that that way to not compete uh, and to make sure that the things that I create are not going to be compared one for one against what a bigger, more resourceful studio can do. So I wouldn't say like working at Naughty Dog taught me that I can just do anything with the art, like the artist can make the most amazing things and, and the game is going to be awesome for it. it. It was more about just the style of production that they have there taught me a lot about focus and real kind of think about what the final result is going to be. Don't think about the components that make it up as much. I mean, the components are important, but one, one problem I used to have as an engineer is that I would want the code to be perfect. I wanted mm. the systems that I was designing to be, to be elegant and to, if an engineer looked at them, I wanted them to think, yeah, man, that's pretty good, pretty good code he's got there. But 
what I learned at Naughty Dog is none of that matters. What matters is what happens when the player puts the controller in their hand. And a lot of times those two things are connected, but a lot of times they're not. And it's a difficult lesson to learn if you're strictly an engineer all the time uh, to, to sort of back off on your number one OCD skill. <laughs> right. I say that actually what's more important is that, you know, even if this is kind of shitty code here, it works pretty much how I I can predict how it works and I know that the end result will sort of be like this and that feels really good to the player. So that was a, a good lesson too. Right, yeah. We'll, we'll get into the sort of uh, the economy of, of uh, independent development in a second because I'm very interested in, in talking to you about that, especially as somebody who sort of works from home uh, myself as well. Um, but first of all, I guess that initial leap to, to go you know, your own way, to, to leave the, the collaborative workspace of Naughty Dog, where did that come from? Well, it started... It started before Naughty Dog, actually, because I, in college, I was working on Quake Mods with a couple of friends, international friends. We decided to start a company in, in Virginia, not far from you, actually. Yeah, you're, was it R- Richmond we grew up or in that area? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, in Richmond. We decided to start a company together, and we were small, you know, four or five guys, and we were working on uh, weird games, different games that we thought could sell. So that didn't work out in the end, and I ended up going to LA to get, you know, real works where somebody could just pay me. But in the back of my mind, I, I even working at Naughty Dog or working uh, in uh, serious games, I had always kind of felt not out of place, but man, I really wish I could be working on my own stuff. Uh, and when it came time for Uncharted 3, uh, I basically thought, well, I mean, I have a bunch of ideas that I want to do, small games, experimental stuff that I can do by myself or with my wife. Uh, who's also a game programmer. So I'm just going to try to do that now. Instead of staying around for you know the next sequel or whatever, uh, I'm going to try to do that instead. So it wasn't so much that I was rejecting anything about Naughty Dog. It was just I was kind of pining for the old times when I was had less less responsibility, but also not part a small piece of a big picture, but kind of the only piece of a very small picture. At that stage, was there was there projects that you had sort of on the horizon, like on your mind's horizon that you wanted to do, or is it more a case of just having that sort of process where you could you could you know set your own uh, destination and and work on things the way you wanted to? Well, at at Naughty Dog and Uncharted One, Uncharted Two was pretty crazy. It was a lot of work, so I, I didn't have a lot of time to think about other stuff. Um, I was totally occupied with those games while I was working on them. But there was a time uh, when we had shipped, I don't remember the date exactly, but there was a time when I had some free time, basically. We we had just shipped something, or we were about to ship something, or something to finish, some big milestone to finish. And I wrote a game called uh, Mightier with my wife, and it was an experimental kind of puzzle platformer game. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and just working on that was kind of... The culmination of an idea I'd been thinking about for a while, and then we made it, and it was a lot of fun, and we got nominated for the IGF, uh, and that kind of put a little seed, you know, planted a little seed that uh, maybe I should start thinking about these sorts of games more, and that's kind of just what happened over the next year or whatever when I was still working at Naughty Dog, thinking, you know, I got a couple ideas here and there, but actually, none of that was, you know, a reason to leave. It was more just that Uncharted 2 had shipped, and if I'm going to leave, now is really the best time. Uh, I don't right. want to... I don't want to start working on a new project and leave in the middle of that. It's like if there's going to be a sever, it's going to be now. So uh, we hadn't really figured out what we're going to do when we left our jobs uh, until we left. We left and we kind of just played around with a bunch of ideas and then came up with uh, Helsing's Fire. So it was it wasn't you know oh man I really want to make Helsing's Fire. I got to leave Naughty Dog to do it. It was more okay now what are we going to do that we've left and we decided to try this independent games thing oh, let's try this a couple different ideas and okay let's do this one sort of thing uh, it's been fun diving back into your design history um uh, especially on your website you have a bunch of uh, games uh, on there sort of flash games that people can go play right now um, and it's been fun i guess backwards charting maybe some design influence that came from those early projects too but most the game that most people sort of um, know you from even now perhaps is papers please um which is interesting because it's a game that sort of you know the elevator pitch for not necessarily something maybe that you'd imagine people would get very um excited about um but obviously uh, as a game playing experience it's it's incredibly compelling what do you think it is about papers please that actually sort of um 
cemented uh, its place within the gaming zeitgeist when it came out in 2013? Uh, good question. If I knew, I could sell it in a packet. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, it, you know, if you ask me, I would say it's just very different from what, what uh, the other games that are available. So right. if, yeah. if you, in the off chance, want a game about checking passports, uh, you got to come to me, basically. And that was kind of <laughs> kind of my theory about me making games alone is my only chance is really to make something you ha you can't get somewhere else easily. Uh, so Papers, Please was kind of that. And it was, I, I didn't have visions of grandeur with that game. I was sort of making the game that I, I would want to play as a kind of analytical kind of OCD-ish kind of details-oriented person. And I tried to capture good gameplay and weave it with the narrative, just kind of, you know, as I would make any, as, as I kind of would want to be in a game I play. So I didn't kind of think, I'm aiming for the zeitgeist here. I was thinking, okay, I need to make something different. And these mechanics I have work pretty well for this kind of story. And if I can put them together in an interesting way, then I would like the the way it turned out in the end. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's a, a little bit of luck, I think, as well. The timing kind of worked out with the explosion of streaming games or uh, YouTube Let's Plays and sort of things where Papers, Please, I think works pretty well in that format because you can role play as the inspector. And, you know, you can, somebody who's who's playing that game can be funny and can be fun to watch when they play it. And I think that lined up pretty well with just the timing of when I release the game, which is which is pure luck. You know, that's not something I planned. And I, I, marketing wise, I didn't do anything for that game that you would actually consider marketing. So, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of clever planning on my part for that. I was really just trying to make a game that I thought I would enjoy and everything else sort of, you know, fell into place. You say that, you know, that there wasn't a lot of um, sort of marketing done around it, but it did have a very strong trailer. Like I still remember the music and the, the you know, maybe it's just because I'm a video guy or whatever, but like, I remember it was very well cut to the music and, and compelling. Uh, did you work on that as well yourself? Yeah, I made that too. So one of the things about picking game ideas uh, for me, when I sit down, I, I collect, you know, as I'm doing anything, I'm always thinking, okay, that might make a cool game. And I'll just write down a quick note about it. And I sort of collect those over time. And then the ones that stick in my mind the most, I, I, I sort of focus on those more. So something like Papers, Please, or even Oberdin, when I'm even thinking about the idea, I'm thinking, how could I express this in a trailer? If if it can't be expressed in a if I can't imagine right now a cool trailer for this then uh, it's probably not worth pursuing and it's kind of part of the decision I think about making games is at the very beginning like that so it's not the idea that I I like this other game and I want to make a game like that only better it's that I want to make this game and I can sort of see all the way through how it's going to be uh, how it's going to be how I can market it in air quotes or how I can talk about it or how I can think about it for you know a year or four and a half years or whatever it will take to get it done. So the initial idea is very important to me. So something like Papers, Please, where it's a game about checking passports, I can also, I can already kind of imagine that it, you can have a trailer just showing the guy denying passports the whole time and it can be interesting, basically. Uh, last week we uh, we had Mariam Dichkevita on who works for Game Workers Unite and we were talking about politics and games and, and political games um, and uh, we, we, we talked about Papers, Please because it was actually something she wrote an article about years ago um, uh, as, as sort of, she's Lithuanian and then she was quite critical of it because she felt like it wasn't um, political in the way that she, she was maybe expecting. W were you trying to make a political game or were you literally trying to make a a game about checking passports and the sort of the uh the 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 wider theme that's 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 you know very well presented within the game sort of came from that like what was what was the impetus of this was it meant to be political or was it was it was it something that you were just compelled with that sort of you know that ocd nature of checking passports at uh, at border uh, sections yeah nothing i i never set out to make a political game and i think for me personally i couldn't start with the the message and then make a good game out of it. If you gave me an assignment and said make a game that gets that projects this message, I probably couldn't do it very well. Uh, it was really the mechan the core mechanics that I had that I felt uh, first I can make a fun game out of it for me. I can make it where you're just checking information, you're correlating information. That could be fun. The mechanics of that could be fun. Uh, and then I started working on the narrative, and I I wanted that kind of complexity of and that lack of clarity because mm. that a lot of politics is about lack of clarity in my opinion so i wanted to express 
sort of how not both sides are equal, but both sides believe in their cause fairly strongly. And it's hard to to present that in a in a movie or a book. But when you have an interactive medium like games, it becomes a lot more uh, possible to to have the player to put the player in a position where suddenly it's not so clear cut what they would do in this situation. And it wasn't until I had the mechanics and some idea about the narrative that that sort of that became important to me to express that. And I, I didn't want to make it very clearly for one side or the other, because I don't know, to me that the game is a lot more powerful when the player is kind of stuck in the middle there and that they're not, Mm. they don't have enough information really to even decide who are the good guys and who are the really bad guys. So to me, that's like life. You don't ever really know the whole story of anything and you still have to make decisions. You still have to live and, and work that way. So, uh, yeah, I did not start out with a message and an idea uh, that I wanted to teach the player something. It was more I, with the tools I had, I, I recognized there was an interesting way to construct a narrative, an interactive narrative here that the player could enjoy. And then obviously the, the game went on to great uh, critical um, and, and commercial success as well. And I, I believe the only other, uh, the only other time we've ever talked actually was I believe uh, you received, was it the Seamus McNally Grand Prize at the IGF that year? Yeah. GameSpot had me backstage interviewing everyone coming off, um, uh, and I, we we talked for probably about thirty seconds. But obviously, you know, then you know uh, you were probably you were well known within the industry and within the independent industry. But then you became sort of uh, infamous within you know the wider uh, game playing uh, community. So what was it like then trying to make a second game? Because suddenly. You know, you have a lot of eyes on you and uh, there have been many creators who have, you know, created a game that has been very successful and then the pressures of having that follow-up um, proved to be too much. How did you sort of uh, uh, deal with it and how did the, the concept for Oberdin sort of come out of that? That's That whole follow-up thing, sophomore effort, you know, it's not my sophomore game. I've made a lot of games, so <clears throat> there wasn't as much pressure in that sense that uh, can I even do it. Or can I even make a game? That was fine. Uh, there was a lot of pressure uh, about how to follow up with Papers, Please. Um, I spent a couple years worrying about that. And that's you know one of the reasons why Oberdin took so long. It took me a long time to get tired of worrying about that, more or less, which is what happened. I, you know, I stressed out about it for two or three years uh, and then finally said, I just got to finish this game. Um, not fuck it, but very close mm. to fuck it i gotta finish this game <laughs> more like damn it i've got to finish this game <laughs> you got kids you know you gotta be careful yeah well i mean th- that's a good point i got kids and they're get- they're growing in front of my eyes and if i don't just finish this game then i can't sort of focus on them again i wanted to right. put the game away and focus on the kids more um so that was a good incentive uh and that's enough you know having kids was actually really important for me because even if Oberdin sucked and was a huge failure, my kids don't care. Uh, they have don't even know about any of that stuff, and so that support was always there, whether whether Oberdin was good or not. So that helped a lot, and that took a couple years to even see because of just kind of the papers please was a whirlwind uh, for me, and uh, it wasn't until things cooled off uh, and I'd been working on Oberdin for a long time that I realized that like even if it sucks, I'm just going to finish it and release it. Uh, But the other thing is uh, kind of the way I make games is I try to get a lot of pieces together that I think will be will make a good game without actually knowing exactly how the game is going to turn out in the end and changing things along the way. Maybe the the way I envisioned the game originally is not how it ends up, but what I envisioned was made of these parts. And then I just reshuffled them along the way and added a few things and took away a few things. And then I I released the game and Papers, Please was like that. And Oberdin was like that, too. So from very early i had i had pretty good confidence in the pieces i had for oberdin i di- i wasn't confident that i could actually make a good game out of it but i thought the individual pieces there's probably a good game here maybe i can't find it but i feel like these elements could come together and could make a good game so it's worth working on the elements sort of independently i guess uh w- without seeing how exactly how they're going to go together just having kind of a little bit of faith that they're going to go together okay and that pulled me through you know a couple down periods over the years as well i've read before about how papers please sort of came from the you know your 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 travels and and going to border guards and having that experience and you know the the idea sort of springs from that um 
how about the return of the Oberdin? Where did you come up with the sort of overall concept? There's one game actually that's on your website, uh, Ducup.com. Um, the Sea Has No Claim, which I've really enjoyed playing, um, which has some sort of both graphical and sort of thematic uh, connections to Oberdin. Um, is there any connective tissue there or where did the idea for uh, Oberdin sort of stem from originally? I mean, the project itself started with, I want to make a one-bit 3D game. So I didn't have the idea of the ship or anything, uh, the murder mystery, the watch, the flashbacks, none of that. It was really, let me sit down and try to make a one-bit 3D game. Uh, and once I started doing that, I had a couple different ideas I could do with it. One of them was set in Egypt. One of them would be on a ship. One of them is somewhere else, a uh, uh, power plant. And just sort of thinking about having to do everything, I thought, well, the easiest thing is going to be a ship because it's a contained space. So I kind of just decided, okay, it's going to be a ship. And I started researching. Uh, And at the same time, I was getting my chops down with Maya again. I'd used Maya a long time ago, but I hadn't done a lot of 3D stuff recently. So a lot of learning was happening on the tool side, which meant less focus on what am I actually going to do with this. So by the time I realized that the ship was going to be a huge pain in the ass and a ton of work, it was too late. I was already committed to it. So that kind of gave me the ship idea. And you're right that there's there's kind of um, vapors of Oberdin in my other games. There's another game called Six Degrees of Sabotage, which is kind of where you're re- recognizing connections between groups of people, which also you know is thematically similar to Oberdin. Um, I, I thought about this a little bit when um, I was giving... Somebody asked me for some advice about their game and... My advice kind of boiled down to add a lot more people to your game. Uh, And so when that happened, I realized that the way I think about narratives, I guess, and gameplay really uh, falls back on just having lots of people, something about having a lot of people and and characters and interactions uh, to me is mechanically provides a lot of opportunity and also uh, gives me... um, kind of motivation for building an interesting narrative. So Oberdin is just a ton of people. And like I said, I didn't know exactly how they were all going to fit together, but I kind of felt if you give me 60 people, I, there's got to be something I can do with that. You know, <laughs> there, There's got to be some way I can put this together. It's kind of like establishing the problem space and then recognizing not the solution, but that, okay, that I've seen the shape of that problem before and it looks really interesting. I want to try to solve that. When you look back at that, you know, the manifest of all those names, those 60 people, um, is there any ones that stand out to you like that, that, that you became like little favorites of yours? Uh, well, an interesting uh, element of the game is that I did not attach the names to those characters until kind of late. <laughs> okay. Uh, they were, I modeled them randomly. I just created a bunch of random characters, uh, dressed them randomly as well. And then name them randomly at the end, uh, so or near the end at least. But uh, I, what I tried to do is I tried to make a lot of people kind of human, so not black or white or not clearly evil or clearly good. Maybe there's one or two f- fully evil guys there, but you know they have motivations that maybe could be justified in some way. So w- one thing that surprised me is that I when I created the characters and I kind of assigned their stories and wrote all the scripts and things like that, I was thinking very mechanically at the low level. So I I need to sprinkle enough clues around that the player can figure out who they are. And also at the high level of what do these characters mean to each other and how are they interacting and who generally is on this side or on that side. And I wanted to show that on these ships that it's, First off, they're very dangerous. Uh, people die all the time. And so your survival depends on, to some extent, getting along with people. And, you know, you spend your a very long time in a very small space with these people. And it just by the nature of it, you have to get along. If you don't get along, then someone gets hurt or someone dies or they get off at the next stop or something like that. So I, I wanted to express that in the game. I'd, I'd read a lot of literature about uh, these ships um, before designing the story and the characters and things. Um, and some of the characters, uh, when the player meets them initially, they look like bad guys. And I, I wanted to sort of set that up where your first impression is that this is guy is a murdering asshole. Um, 
But as you see them more and more, you realize that they're human and they have friends who were killed or they were put in these difficult situations that sort of flipped the switch in them or just made them worry more about their survival than everyone else's survival or things like that. So uh, one of the good examples of that is uh, this guy, uh, Brennan, Henry Brennan, who, <clears throat> when you first meet him, seems basically just like a tough guy who's who's bloodthirsty and wants to kill people. Um, but if you think about in the context of a ship and what people's duties are, uh, he's not doing half bad. You know, he's maybe he's a little bit aggressive, but you kind of need somebody like that on a ship or you need people to, to do that sort of thing on in these situations when there's, you know, when there's, I, I can't say these kinds of disasters because it's pretty fantastic, but when there's that <laughs> kind of trial, you, you know, these guys are not necessarily the bad guys. They're just the ones who have a clear vision of what to do. And it, you know, some people get hurt in the in the act, then kind of that's something they also calculated. So uh, Brennan was one of those guys. And what surprised me actually is uh, my wife was the first person to play the game all the way through. And the, the whole game didn't come together until maybe two months before release to actually be able to play from beginning to end. And she uh, really liked Brennan, which was uh, <laughs> kind of an indication that... Uh, the kind of setup that I was going for worked because he, yeah, he's pretty, he kills a lot of people basically. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. His face was, kind of keeps appearing. <laughs> yeah. He, he's a pretty aggressive dude, but he has qualities enough that uh, he, my wife was liked him basically. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, it's, it's, you know, I, I encourage anyone who's played the game to, to, um, uh, Google Henry Brennan and, and when, once the face pops up, you'll know exactly uh, who we're talking about. Yeah. Um, one of the things that stood out to me as well as, as a, as an Irish person who, you know, I lived in London for, for a number of years too, um, was the, the voice cast for this game was, was tremendous. And, you know, even outside of that, I felt like I sort of had an unfair advantage in that, you know, accents were, were very cleverly delivered. There was one actual accent that was from the North of Ireland that I thought, oh, that must be, that must be somebody um, from Ireland. There's a there's a character called Patrick O'Hagan in the game. I actually went to school with somebody called Patrick O'Hagan. So, <laughs> can you talk about the I guess the the work in in getting all of those different voices? Um, how much you know? How much did you know about different voices in in the British Isles and and, and Europe? I guess as well, and also abroad. You know, there's there's a, a quite a complex um, number of languages being used as well. Uh, how much work went into that? And 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 you know, did it come easily to you, or was it the type of thing that took a lot more work than you're expecting? That's a good question. Actually, it's one of my favorite questions about Oberdin, and it it's good to talk to you about it because you know these accents. I do not know any of these accents, um, <laughs> but I knew that they were important. And one of the things I like about making games is to pick something like that that is normally not important and make it important. So normally when you hire a voice actor, they can do lots of different accents. Hmm. And it would have been very easy for me to hire a few Americans to do all those accents and just call it a day. But I knew that, first off, I would be uh, torn up in the UK <laughs> because they would know they were all bad. Absolutely. I, you know, I personally have heard people, foreigners, do bad Southern US accents. So I know that feeling when it's wrong. Right. Uh, and I didn't want anybody to have that feeling. And But I'd, I'd made this sort of critical importance on the accents. And it's the same thing with the audio in the game. I, I wanted to make a game where it's not just that I wanted a game with great audio. I wanted a game where the aud the quality of the audio was actually critical to the, I mean, it's kind of making it hard for me, but it, the quality of the audio is important to the actual mechanics of the game. So in this case, the, the accents of the characters was important to the mechanics of the game. Uh, so I, I basically um, had to just find native voice actors for every case. And uh, I because I don't know those accents myself, I have friends who are there at least who could help me decide if they're, you know, if it's not somebody, if it's uh, somebody doing a Welsh accent, for instance, it's actually kind of tricky to find good Welsh actors easily. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the things, I, you know, I didn't do was I didn't hire a casting agent to go out and do this for me. I basically just went to Voices.com or Voice123.com and and talk with their casting people and and they would do it. But that all of those uh, actors there kind of skew for a certain region. So some some roles were hard to cast. And like I said earlier, a lot of different people can do a lot of diff different accents. So it's not that when you say you have an Irish character, you may get lots of people who are not Irish auditioning for that. Right. Uh, and some cases I would use those guys if I would, if I could play that 
that they're auditioned for a native speaker and they could tell me that's that dude sounds Irish, then okay, he's good. Because there's a what was most important to me was a performance. If their performance sound convincing, I wanted to hire them for the role. Then I would send it to somebody who could recognize that accent and they would say it's good or it's bad. Uh, hopefully they would say it's good and I could use that performance and that, that actor. Uh, sometimes they would say it's bad and I would say, well, okay, I have to, I'm sorry, I have to find somebody else. Uh, in one case, uh, it was bad or it was not the accent that I wanted for the region that I wanted, but the, the performance was so good that I changed the character to be a different region, basically. <laughs> Uh, so he was supposed to be Welsh, uh, but uh, the, it was he did a straight up English accent, um, RP maybe. Uh, and so I decided this guy is, for the purpose of this character, I need the performance to be very good. And his performance was excellent. So it's more important to get that than it is that the, the, his location is correct. So I changed his location in the game. Yeah, and I guess then sort of how that reacts to, to to the mechanics of the game and that, you know, I felt like I had an unfair advantage because I could pick out a Welsh accent and a Scottish accent as opposed to, say, a North English accent. Um, but then also, you know, you're also, there's a, there's a very, there's a lot of sort of classism going on on a ship, right? So you have, you know, second mates and, and, and the captain and, and all them, you know, and the bosun sort of at a, they're a certain strata of English society. Well, I guess in the case of the bosun is Austrian, but, you know, you're talking sort of like well-to-do uh, you know privately educated English people but then you also have like you know all of the you know midshipmen who are from sort of more working class parts of England so like how did you account for the fact that people in the British Isles would probably have basically more information to solve these clues than you know people who weren't from there well it's a good point about that and what's interesting to me is that I didn't know all that stuff mm. really I didn't know that uh most of the people in the UK can pick out within a hundred mi- hundred kilometer radius where somebody is from based on their accent. <laughs> totally. And not only that, but their class within that region, they know where they are on that scale of, you know, working class or well-to-do. Uh, I had an idea about that, but not really how specific it was, how powerful <laughs> the, <laughs> that scale is in most, in most British people. So luckily when you hire native voice actors and you tell them about the character, they know. So they know how to, to read. They know how to perform. The actors know this stuff. So on that side, the authenticity was okay because the I didn't know, but the actors knew. That's one reason you, know, you hire good actors. On the gameplay side, I didn't know any of these things. So I, for me, I can assume those clues are there, but I can't rely on them personally. So I had to supplement all those places where this guy's identity is revealed by his Scottish accent. I had to supplement that with some other clues somewhere else for me personally, but also for anybody else who's not from the Isles, you know. So that was just kind of naturally baked into the way the game was made by an American who doesn't know these things as well as a British person would. So on, I, I knew it had to be accurate, but I also knew that I wouldn't be able to tell and it wouldn't help me personally. So kind of a tr- tricky thing to think about, but... It, I, it basically meant that I had to be okay with people in the UK would play the game and would have more clues than other people who didn't know those accents, which was, you know, I think a small sacrifice in my opinion, because because I didn't know how how useful those clues were, I couldn't really consider them as something really that I should worry about. Yeah, I, and I mean, as you said, you know, having sort of accents in games are so often... Um the opposite they're kind of misleading and you have to kind of read the intention of the author in a way whereas yeah. um, i can definitely say that from my perspective it, it added a richness to the experience that that i really appreciated um so too did the just general sound effects of the game like you know, we're, a lot of this game involves you know sort of stepping you know not using your eyes at all and just kind of going into your mind's eye and, and imagining the scene uh before it's eventually sort of presented to you at the end of the sound clip um can you talk about the process of doing that because you know the production value on those is is very very uh high but also there's lots of clues like you're 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 telling clues in audio which we're not really used to in games yeah I, that was like i said earlier that was kind of a a thing I recognized I could do, and I, I really wanted to try it, basically. That was a really interesting challenge for me, is to make the audio mechanically important. Um, I have done sound effects in a lot of games uh, for myself um, over the years, so it's something I enjoy doing. I didn't, when starting this project, I didn't realize 
the challenge really, uh, the, the full scope of the challenge. It was extremely difficult. And one thing that made it harder was that I didn't record much of it myself. I recorded a few Foley effects here and there, but most of it was sourced from sound libraries. So what I would mostly do is just spend a long time, a long time searching sound libraries for just the right sound effect. And a lot of times not finding it and deciding to rewrite things or change things a little bit uh, so that I could uh, express what I want or something, something useful or some kind of clue or something. Um, and I, I wrote the whole game. So instead of like, you can imagine if it was a team of multiple people with the sound guys here and the story guys and design guys separately, it would be a lot harder, I think. But for me, I, because I wrote the whole game, I have every scene in my head. I can close my eyes and see <laughs> the whole thing in movement and where they are and what the ship is doing and everything else. It's all just in my head. So <clears throat> pulling out from that what's important sound-wise was a little bit tricky. Uh, sound, you know, sound is about focus. If you actually stick a mic in one of those situations, you would be overwhelmed with the amount of things that you would hear. Right. Uh, so part of the challenge there was figuring out exactly what I need to be playing for it to, to give the information to the player, but also enough sounds that, that you feel like you're there. So it's not just the key sounds that you would need to figure out, uh, you, you know, what's going on, but also to make you feel like you're on a ship in this place, uh, during a storm or whatever, and then balancing all those things together. Yeah, it was a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> and it was the kind of thing where, I normally, when I work on a game, I, I jump around from here to there. So I work on some art and then, okay, I get tired of working in Photoshop. <clears throat> so let me do some programming. Let me do some sound, maybe some music. For this, uh, for the audio sound effects stuff, I had to sit down for a month and a half, basically, <clears throat> and just work on it straight. Right. So, yeah, it was hard. And it, it required a lot of focus over a long period of time, which I wasn't used to at that point. So... It was kind of a pr production wrinkle for me. But in the end, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And I, the thing I like most about it is that it's, it, it's like I said earlier, it's it, I wasn't just trying to make it sound good. I, wanted, th th I had a gameplay core mechanic goal with the sound that I tried to, to execute. It's, it's, you talked about how, you know, the ship, the, the idea of the location for the ship was sort of born from, from an earlier process. And then you sort of went into that, you know, the, 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 the storytelling process to try and flesh that out. And um, one of the interesting things you said, like sort of making something, you know, that's not important, important. One of those things in this game is, is I guess the language of seafaring. Like it, it, I feel like everyone, once they've completed this game, they sort of get boats in a way that that maybe they didn't when they started um was that a an advantage maybe of of you know from from like a world building perspective or even from like a puzzle perspective the fact that like people don't know what a bosun is maybe or a midshipman or a topman when i started when i decided i'm going to make a game about a east indian trade ship that uh, has this problem i researched a lot about it and when i was building the ship itself i had to do a lot of research about how those ships are constructed and that is a deep, deep, <laughs> deep yeah, rabbit hole, I bet. let me tell you. Uh, people have been making model ships for hundreds and hundreds of years, and those guys are crazy, full-on, 100% nuts. So every single piece of a ship has a specific name, and it's, they're all weird and funny, and they're usually like, it was heard in Italian, and then repeated by the Portuguese, and then the British <laughs> started using it kind of thing. So Right. That to me was super interesting, just how deep, how both wide and deep it, the knowledge, it, the custom knowledge is for sailing ships. Uh, and I didn't even begin to scratch the surface of that with the game because I knew that I, I couldn't. There was just too much crazy shit in there that I could have referenced that I, that I didn't. And it all, I, I basically wanted just enough to add the flavor, like you say. Uh, but without confusing the player too much, or at least in cases where it wasn't that important. Um, and what's funny is there's a glossary in the game that, that defines a couple of these terms. That was like in the last two weeks of the game. I had a oh, glossary. really? That was, that was in there. Yeah. Um, I wanted, I had this idea that people would go search for it on Google or something, which, you know, what, what a <laughs> terrible idea. I think I did. I think I, I, yeah, I remember, I remember looking at the glossary maybe 40 minutes in. I was like, all right, you know what? Fuck this. I need to like learn about this sort of stuff. But I had Googled on my phone, I think 
what what something was like a midshipman maybe or I, yeah. I, you know yeah it's all those terms th- nobody else uses them so you just got to use a few of them and suddenly you feel like you're you're there kind of thing so i recognize that very early that that the potential was there and i really wanted to do that and i again it's the kind of thing where there's not a lot of games that are going to go that are going to reference these terms as if they're important uh they may throw them around just for some flavor but in this case, you know, you actually need to know who a, who a topman, what a topman is, or what a midshipman is. So I also like that aspect of it, and I tried to pick words like that where they were they weren't totally uh, abandoned words. They were kind of maybe you know someone might have heard them recently if they read like a Patrick O'Brien novel or something like that. They they would get the references. I could see that. Yeah, they're sort of evocative of what they are as well. Some of them, you know, uh, other ones maybe not so much. Um, I've got a million questions for you about uh, Return of the Oberdin, but I feel like I should uh, throw in a couple of patron ones, uh, seeing as they're the ones funding all this. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, thanks so so much to all of our patrons to help make our work ad free and uh, to get they all get this uh, show a day early. But of course, it's, like all of our stuff, it's all uh, free for everyone. Uh, Patreon.com slash noclip if you're interested in helping us out. Uh, the first one comes from Brett G. Uh, says, uh, what do you consider the canon monitor choice for Oberdin? Um, Macintosh for the win. Uh, the, the art style of the game, very unique. Uh, I can sort of, I'm reading into what you're talking about. It, it, it's, you know, maybe a way for you to uh to to, i do a lot of art on your own in a 3d space without going absolutely insane um well well, yeah what's the what's the uh, canon monitor choice for you which way do you play definitely macintosh he's right of course that was the first color that was the first and only color i had for a long time until uh somebody asked me or a couple people asked me for rgb sliders for the oh really black and white colors and i'm not a guy who's going to put rgb sliders in because there's too many ones that look terrible basically so <laughs> yeah i started with the Mac. You, you literally made gooey tools like that should be right down your alley yeah my solution would be to give you like the nine colors that look good basically and not <laughs> give you those sliders to make the bad colors and that's kind of what i did and i so mac the mac colors are the ones that for me i developed the whole game in the mac and then when i was sort of playing through the game and testing it a lot i would try one of the other colors and the one i like the most uh, after the mac is there's an ibm sort of brownish brown and white one that i like as well i can't remember the name of it but it's not the green ibm one it's the other one uh that is, is a nice soothing color as well <laughs> uh next question comes in from chris uh chris petter says uh, did you draw inspiration from other detective games when designing oberdon uh, if so were there any aspects in how that genre has been tackled in past games that you wanted to rectify on your own and um, i was watching a live stream you did uh, on the gdc channel recently and i was interested to hear that lots of the games that have come out over the past couple of years sort of first person uh, detective games like the vanishing of ethan carter uh, you actually hadn't played um uh, yeah w- was there any games that did sort of uh, in inspire you with Oberdin? I don't think so. Not with the detective aspect anyways. Um, I was visually inspired by the Mac Macintosh games I played as a kid, but design wise, uh, no, I was trying to do something different. And then games like Ethan Carter or uh, Edith Finch or uh, some of the Sherlock Holmes games, people would tell me that they're kind of similar to the old demo I had, or they would suggest me check them out. But I, I kind of just want, I felt like if I, if I look at those games, I'm either going to change what I'm doing or try to do something different. I figured like the best thing to do is just not play those games until I'm done with right. what I'm working on here. Um, so the, yeah. And you know, Oberdin, like I said, I had the pieces of what I felt could make a good game, but I didn't have the whole thing together in one piece until very late. So I, you could kind of say, I didn't know what I was doing for a long time, uh, which meant I wasn't getting, you know, there's not, if I'm inspired, then I kind of would put them together in a certain way, but I was putting them together in lots of different ways, trying to figure out the best way to do it. So there, yeah, on the one hand, I'm trying to make a different game. So I don't want to take too much inspiration from anything, but on the other hand, I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm even not together enough to be inspired properly, I guess. Ben Visness asks, uh, when I played Oberdin, I was struck by how consistent everything was. I didn't notice any information that would be misleading or a red herring. So my questions are, uh, what was the writing process like? Uh, did you write every crew member's story up front? No, definitely not. And uh, it's a good point he makes because I <clears throat> I intentionally avoided red herrings. There were a lot of places where I uh, had the opportunity to fool the player into thinking one thing, but then revealing another. And I 
I actually do it in, I think there's one death where the means of death is not totally clear. And I, I did that intentionally there. But for identities, I tried very hard to make your first <clears throat> sort of supposition the right one. So uh, not trying to fool the player, just because there's 60 people. It's just too much. When you start trying to put red herrings in and 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 kind of tricking the player, I felt like that was just right too much. I was really worried the whole game that, I'm asking way too much from the player. And the book itself is kind of my solution to that, to help the player understand what is going on, who is who, to 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 let them traverse the web a little easier. So I was very worried that the game is just way, way, way too hard the whole time I was working on it. So I consciously avoided red herrings like that. That doesn't mean there aren't any in the game, actually. Um, there is an, an unintentional one, a pretty big one, uh, near the beginning of the game where... Uh, I didn't realize it, but there's some dialogue about a character that's referring to one character. But actually, if you play the game and you're not me who doesn't know everything, <laughs> you would think it's referring to a different character and you would be confused about that for a long time. And that's, yeah, I regret that that slipped through. Uh, my wife didn't catch it. Uh, I didn't catch it. So it's only later on when people started talking about the game, they they thought, oh, this guy was that guy for the longest time. And I, you know, kind of just sighed and regret that a little bit. So I, I really didn't want that to happen. I wanted it to be, uh, not tricking the player just because not not that I love the player, but it, I was sure that this is way too difficult and I shouldn't be fucking around like that. I mean, how did you even like play test this? If, you, if you're saying your wife was the first person to play the game from start to finish, but were you, st- were you still like, you know, sending it to other people and and, and having them give you feedback? Because like, I just can't imagine how you would possibly be able to put yourself in the position of a new player when you, you know, you know how everything works. You're the puppet master. Yeah, this is another question I like. I, I didn't play test this game very much at all. I play tested an old build without the book. And that's when I realized I need the book. Right. Um, <clears throat> but my solution was tools, lots and lots of tools. So one of the things I do when I try to solve a problem is I need to visualize the problem. So <clears throat> in the case of this game, there are ways you can build tools that let you visualize that there are enough clues everywhere for this character, for example. So you don't need to play through. You just can see, okay, there's a clue for this guy here, here, and here. That's enough. Uh, this person's <clears throat> identity is revealed at this point uh, and then he, once you know his identity, you can figure out this other guy's identity and this other guy's identity. And you can, without playing the game, you can you can graph that on a directed acyclic graph. You can graph when identities are revealed. And that hooks into the, my kind of heavy dependence on tools to make this happen, is that I can write a tool that generates that graph, then I can just look at the graph, and I can see there's a problem here. This guy, you're not going to know who this guy is in order to figure out who this guy is. So, okay, I need to add more clues in the scene. So basically figuring out sort of the problem space and then a way to visualize it for me was a solution instead of building something, having somebody test it, building it again, having somebody play it. And that that sort of feed, that loop of, of playtesting, I didn't need for this particular thing because I could express it and visualize it in a way that let me just check it instantly, basically. Wow. Uh, the book is a, obviously a, a massive part of the design of this game which you know solves a lot of problems um i'm sure for you but i i can't imagine how difficult it was to sort of figure out how to use it it's, it's almost like a, a diegetic interface in a way and and also you know the, the ability for you to i guess you know travel on the pages at least between the different um uh, death scenes uh, I, I remember hearing a bunch of people getting frustrated that they couldn't just you know bounce between the the you know teleport almost between the the different um uh, the death scenes after a certain point uh, but can you just kind of speak to the design philosophy of the book was it really important that people you know got familiar with the boat and walking around it and 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 that the death scenes themselves were sort of more isolated little pockets that they they couldn't get too lost in i think so yeah that that decision is kind of rooted in the original concept of the game where you didn't have the book so how are you going to fast travel if you don't have the book um the book seems obvious in retrospect but i was pulling my hair out for a long time about how to structure and arrange the events on the on the ship for a long time in a way that the player could reference and and understand easily uh, and actually, if you look uh, in the book, there's a, a deck map, which 
shows all the the flashbacks, <clears throat> the location of the body of each flashback. And there's this, like this once you finish them all, there's like this really crazy system of arrows that connects them all. And if you look at it, it's just a jumble of spaghetti arrows and and X's and shit. That was originally my solution to letting the player understand. There was no book. It was just that map with arrows everywhere on it. Uh, So you can see, it took me a long time to get from that to a full book with a page for each flashback divided into chapters uh, with referencing and bookmarks and all that stuff. Uh, But once I had the book, I realized how useful it was and how, how it contextualized almost everything in the game. And the metaphor is so easy to understand that I got a lot of things for free, basically by, by doing the book. Um, and, you know, even having like a death on each page wasn't obvious from the beginning though. I had, I had tried a lot of things for how to arrange uh, the structure of the book and sort of ended up with this one. So in my mind, the book was always a supplement to helping you understand the story. It wasn't a way to navigate. And I had this, uh, long-term problem with the Oberdin that there is frankly way too much magic going on. <laughs> uh, and there, was a, <clears throat> there was a real conflict for me between the watch and the spoiler, the mermaids. And, you know, let's be real. If you had that watch, you would get right back on that rowboat, go straight back to the mainland and just rule the world basically. <laughs> so I, I need, I had a lot of really cool ideas about things to do with the watch and I cut them all. I decided the watch is cannot be the star here because if the watch is a star here, then nothing else about this story is important at all. So I tried to downplay the watch a little bit. And likewise, the book to me, being able to fast travel with the book is just too, too video gamey, too magical. Now that's kind of dumb because it's a video game and there's a lot of stuff about this. It's very video gamey. And I, and I, I personally usually lean towards be more video gamey when it's convenient to the player for some reason, maybe because of the way that the book came about and the way the game was developed, I just could not give up the player having to walk around the boat uh, to go to different areas. To me, uh, that that way of like showing the player's intent was just too too good to 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 say like you don't flip to a page and click a button to say you wanted to see this thing again. You put the book away and you walk to it on the ship. Uh, and yeah, it was a tough, really tough call for me because it is inconvenient for the player so it wasn't easy for me to say you're not going to use the book but it, it just to me i couldn't i couldn't have you skip right to the the flashback i, I felt like one of the problems is like you skip right to the flashback let's say through the book <clears throat> and then you're the way you're playing the game is by skipping around so you would want to skip out of the flashback too but i've i've got this system where you walk through a door to get out of the flashback so i could satisfy the first one and say you can fast travel to the thing but then I, I've also got to satisfy the the fact that you can get out of it quickly. And this, that kind of slippery slope to me was just, especially at, at the point where I finished this game, I was beyond done with this thing. Um, I was so exhausted from working on this. And I made so many very big design changes near the end that it was basically like, I don't care if this game gets like a 0% because you can't fast travel. Like I can't deal with the design changes that that's going to inter- inject into this game. So, you know, I can justify it now and say that I don't want the player traveling around, but really like one of the really important parts of that decision is that it, it would have changed so many things so, so late at that point in the game that I just couldn't, couldn't manage it. Um, another sort of, I feel like aspect of the game that, that, you know, gives the player a little bit of a help is um, uh, the verbs. Uh, Am I right in saying that there are some deaths that you can sort of say stabbed or speared or there's a little bit of wiggle room there? Yeah, there's a, a lot of wiggle room. Oh, really? Actually, more more than I anticipated at the beginning. It, it's funny. When I first had the idea for the design of this game, it was mostly about figuring out how people died. It was the means of death that was the important thing. Uh it wasn't until I had a lot more of the game together that I realized, I mean, you can see how he dies. That's not, there's no challenge there. <laughs> right. That's not fun. Uh, and so that whole idea of constructing a sentence became kind of perfunctory. I don't know. It became kind of uh, unimportant. Uh, the identity is important, but the how he died, yeah, maybe, you know, that's, we don't really care how, it, I mean, not that we don't care, but you can see it. It's like, okay, he died this way. Uh, maybe the book can just tell me. I don't need to enter it. 
But the for me, always, the act of building a sentence was fun. This is one of those kind of like really um, carnal sort of low-level joys is just selecting those verbs and those nouns and, and subjects from a list and then having a sentence at the end that you could read was fun. That very low-level thing was fun for me. So I never wanted to give it up. I wanted you to have to select. But I didn't want you to get hung up on it. Uh, and that was a real, real big problem, actually, because I didn't... <clears throat> When I designed, the, the, there were too many things pushing on this game's design, basically. So when I designed the way people died, it was in the context of how to make it interesting for the player to see and how to make it fit within the story of the events of what's happening. And it was not at all how to make a sentence, how to make it easily describable with a sentence. So there are a lot of cases where, uh, yeah, he's getting hit by something. What is that? Is that a spear? Is that a, is that a spike? What is that? Uh, and I didn't want the player to get hung up on that. So what I did is I made it, it's e you could say either spear or spike. Now, the problem with that is that actually doesn't help you get hung up on it or not. You still get hung up on it. You still need to select one of those. They're both right, but you don't know that when you're, you know, when you're worrying about which one to put in. So that, that is kind of a failure, but I still really like just the act of building grammatical sentences, you know, with a kind of cheesy book interface. I like that. And it became... Uh, I liked it so much, I put a lot of work into keeping it. So doing the things where multiple fates are possible or uh, rewriting the fate system multiple times to support localization, which is was a huge can of worms. God, yeah, I c c can imagine, especially with the subtleties involved in those words. Um, yeah. The, uh, well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I picked the right one, but you said there was one character where the, their death was maybe a little bit difficult to deduce because um, it could have been a few things. Was that by any chance uh, Charles the Midshipman? Uh, no, but he's another good one. Actually, that was a case where <clears throat> he died in a very cool way, which is a little bit undescribable in the very simple sentences that I had. So yeah, I just had to kind of <laughs> put a lot of options in for that one. Oh, is there multiple options for, for how Charles dies? That they'll yeah, get, yeah. yeah. I was wondering, cause I, like, but at the, at the point of his death, he's like being burned and spiked and it's just like yeah well, actually what's kind of cool about that one is that one made me realize <clears throat> and i i implemented this in a few other deaths but this one kind of kind of opened it up a little bit uh he's getting spiked he's getting burned and he's also getting potentially stabbed <laughs> by a crewmate <clears throat> so i realized that <laughs> your selection says a lot about how you interpret this situation right. and the scene and, and the guilt of people so if you think he's being stabbed by say you don't like this character who is maybe stabbing him, then you would put in, he's being stabbed by this guy. And that would be in the record and, you know, noted by the, the crown or whatever. <laughs> and, and that kind of opened up a nice extra aspect to the game that I didn't originally intend. And so I went through and I kind of tried to grow that a little bit in a few more of the deaths. But the one I'm talking about that I intentionally made uh, ambiguous uh, is something, uh, it's somebody who's dying, uh, who you think is bleeding out, uh, but actually, at the moment he dies, something happens that is hard to notice. And his original death was he was bleeding out. Uh, I wrote the whole thing that way. The scenes are written like that. The voice actors recorded that, that way. Uh, and it wasn't until very late uh, that I realized the potential for a, a small subversion in what the player expected here, uh, which actually ended up working better because I had this kind of I had this problem that I needed to kill people in lots of different and interesting ways, <laughs> right. which is a weird problem to have. <laughs> uh, and some people die in really cool ways really quickly, you know, an explosion or their heads cut off or whatnot. Uh, and some people bleed out. And I got to tell you, uh, bleeding out is kind of an uninteresting way to die. So the cases where I had people bleeding out, uh, I realized maybe I could do something cooler there. And this was one of those cases where... Uh, you, the player thinks he's bleeding out. I thought he's bleeding out, uh, but actually <laughs> something else is happening. Was there a couple of red herrings in that book as well for the, the verbs for death? Was there a few that weren't used? Yeah, that that's another thing. I, what I liked about is that in games in general, I tried to get the player thinking about how big this world is or how big the, the set of things that they're doing is without actually going that big. Um, and those verbs i really wanted the player's mind to go crazy with that stuff <laughs> you know that's one of the things one of the main reasons also i wanted to keep this verb sentence structure system is just looking at those things is fun to think about 
this how this guy was committed suicide by cannon or whatever or you know just the putting together those different combinations in their head they think what the fuck happened on this boat you know <laughs> even even if they're not used at all even if nobody eats anybody else that still the option to be a cannibal is there and I, you know you can already start thinking cool things when you when you see that verb um, I wanted to keep this question until the absolute last for anyone who's not played, just in case, because we, we've it's been a little li- light, light spoilers maybe in it so far. But um, just step out of the room for the for for two minutes here, um, because I feel like oh, what the fuck happened on this boat? You could, that could have been the name of this game actually, um, and I would have <laughs> described it pretty well. Um, I gotta ask you about the the various beasts. Like, uh, I feel like every new chapter I got into, I just my eyes got wider and wider. Like, I wasn't expecting any of that shit. And by the end, it's just, you know, it's it's just fucking madness. Like, did you come up with, like, where did you pull inspirations for these, you know, giant crabs? And obviously, there's a there's a kraken in there. But like the 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 style of mermaid, like, where did you are this? Is this stuff that you just you found in your research, or did you sort of um? take them from your own twisted brain wrongs uh probably the twisted brain run thing i i had set up just the, the structure of the game meant that i needed to be killing a lot of people right uh and i didn't want them all shooting each other or fighting pirates or anything like that i wanted some variety in, in the way they died uh and i wanted it to kind of yeah keep surprising the player keep showing them something new so i had already set up kind of the the need for lots of things like that uh, not exactly what it should be uh and then i had the overall structure of the story um and this is a <clears throat> huge maybe i won't say it actually because it's too big of a spoiler but I, I i knew i needed a lot of sea creatures uh i knew that i had uh, the story i had in my mind was mermaids i wanted something different actually i wanted something wilder and crazier but at some point i realized this game is so scattered to the player. And this is before the book, way before the book. This game is so scattered. I need some kind of reference for them. I think if I choose mermaids, it's going to be a little bit more accessible. You know, I could, I could do something crazier, but then it's just a little bit too far out there. So I felt, okay, I'll just make them kind of weird, ugly, gross mermaids. (laughs) Uh, And then uh, I kind of figured, uh, okay, I need some something really fucking crazy to try to rescue the mermaids. Uh, I need some, you feel like, okay, with the Kraken, all right, Kraken, that's crazy. I mean, that's, that's wild. Didn't expect that, but you know, I've seen Krakens before. Uh, mermaids. Wow. We're mermaids. I mean, that's a real, that's out of left field there. I mean, okay, but we've all seen mermaids. And then I wanted something that was just really bizarre, something you wouldn't expect at all. And it's kind of something that you could, say this game showed you for the first time right and that was the crab rider guys basically I, and this is funny a lot of games a lot of any media when you've got a bad guy it's a bipedal and looks like a dude in a suit basically um so i had that same restriction where i needed i only had one rig basically for all the characters in the game and i needed to make something some wild creature that looked cool with that rig but also looked different so that's the kelp men basically i gave them a lot of kelp hanging off of them uh and then i living in japan you actually those huge spider crabs are not that far from cultural zeitgeist in japan people know about those things here so that was the kind of thing where that thing looks just fucking awesome in every way. Um, when you see them in the aquarium, you know, you're walking along, you're looking at fish here and you're looking at some crabs and lobsters. That's cool. But when you see the spider crabs, it's like, it's just like from another world. Totally. Um, the funny thing is those guys have no strength at all. You take them out of the water and they just like melt in your hands or something, (laughs) but visually they're just absolutely striking. And I thought, man, I want to ride one of those things. And so that's where these kind of kelp men, crab rider guys came from. It's just that, kind of uh, limitations on the production side of what can I do with a character? I can make a biped and what can I do to make them interesting? And then this crab thing, which was actually making that crab rig was a lot of work because it's only used for two characters in the whole game and it was totally different setup. But 
they looked so cool to me that it, it was worth it and the setup worked out well yeah and it's it certainly you know t- t- tweaked my arachnophobia instincts as well um uh, quite a bit uh really wonderful character design there uh, lucas i could i could talk to you all day but i want to make sure you get a good night's sleep so you can hang out with your family tomorrow um uh, last question from my point of view you know you, you spend a lot of work on these games you know this one was four and a half years you obviously did everything from the you know the the music sound effects the, the art coding the, the whole shebang the marketing uh, you know it, it seems like after one of these is done it takes a lot out of you um what what do you think your learnings are from, from return of the Oberdin and from papers please when when it goes into whatever your next project will be do you think you know just giving yourself the time to do it or or you know from a production side maybe scaling it down a little bit um or do you do you like the work as it is do you like having those you know moments of crunch during the project because it's all sort of on your terms i don't mind crunch that much yeah because it is on my terms and not only that i mean i i work because i love to work i love to do all the things that i do when making games it's my hobby and my passion so uh, I'm lucky enough that I can do that and not have to worry about uh, getting the game out right away to make enough money to survive. Uh, and I I do feel like I worked too long on Oberdin. Four and a half years. I, I wanted to finish it in three to six months, if that gives you any wow. idea of how badly I can answer this question for you. So I would, you know, I would want to do smaller projects and I would aim for smaller projects. But when I did that last time, it didn't quite work out. And it's... <laughs> You know, it's it's fortunate for me that it that it did work out in the end. The game is is okay, and I didn't, you know, have to remortgage my house or anything when I was working on it. So I feel extremely fortunate for that. And I, as far as the future goes, yeah, it it took a lot out of me to to finish Oberdin, um, and I'm sort of cooling off now. You know, I'm I'm getting my strength back now, like I said, but it's probably going to take a while longer and it's probably going to be that I'll try a much, much, much smaller stuff uh, before I jump into another big project. Right. Uh, this, this might be a ghost question, so apologies in advance, but it, it seems like it's done really well from the commercial side. Like, are, are you happy with how it's done? And, and, you know, does that set you up to make your next game? Yeah, absolutely. It's done beyond my expectations. My expectations are already bad just across the board. For papers, please, and for Oberdin. I mean, I should probably know better by now, but... Uh, I when you work on a game for that long and you're that close to it, anyone will tell you this. It's really hard to know what you've got, basically, uh, and especially the way that I finished the game. I felt I got to it. I got it. I had um, a feedback sort of session with uh, one of my close friends who's a designer as well, and it did not go well. So I reactively changed a lot of things about the sort of core game loop, uh, and then did not test it again. Released the game basically. So wow. I. <clears throat> did not have uh, the level of, I won't say confidence, but I I wasn't sure that people would like the game, basically. And that's I mean, that's totally common for games. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm very happy with how well it's done. Uh, and it's, I can't say it's a complete surprise because I, looking on it now, I did enjoy the game at the end. I, I couldn't play it the way that I could play Papers, Please, because Papers, Please has some procedural stuff that Oberdin doesn't have. Right. But I, I always liked the way that it looked. Uh, the one bit was something that I always liked from the beginning to the end. Um, and I, I liked sort of just walking around on a ship, and I could enjoy that uh, all the way through the game. So those sorts of things I felt confident about and, and that uh, people could enjoy that part of it. But as far as like the whole package that people would enjoy the whole thing, uh, you know, I wasn't sure about that at all. And so the way that it's been received has been a, a very nice uh, result for me. Awesome. And good for us too, because that means we got more Lucas Pope games in the future. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dan. And thanks to everyone for listening as well. Uh, you can follow Lucas on uh, the Hellscape of Twitter on do cope, ask do cope. Um, I also recommend, highly recommend you go to docope.com and check out a bunch of the uh, awesome games that we talked about uh, earlier on the podcast as well. Uh, the Sea Has No Claim, Six Degrees of Sabotage and a bunch of other cool stuff there. Uh, you can follow us at Noclip Video on Twitter. I'm at Daniel Dwyer on Twitter. If you have any feedback on the show or ideas for guests, uh, r slash Noclip uh, on Reddit. And of course, uh, hit us up on Noclip, uh, patreon.com slash 
no clip if you're interested in funding our work. The podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and a thousand other fucking things that I can't remember. Um, we have our YouTube channel as well with the archive on it. We have a short URL for it now, youtube.com slash podcast. Patrons get the show early for five bucks. Uh, thank you to all of our patrons for uh, funding our work and making so we can do all this stuff ad-free. Um, thank you for your time and we'll see you next week. Thank you.